tonight. A revelation from a prime minister. Let me reiterate, I want to be absolutely crystal clear. That will send shockwaves around the world. It was understood uh, at the highest levels that this was almost certainly... What did Canberra really know? If that's true, then that would have to point to some kind of cover-up. It seems a key piece of evidence, though, doesn't it? Did they ever mention fire on board? Hijack? Terrorism? And the pilot bombshell. We'd also tracked down the mystery woman. A woman about 20 years his junior. Maybe he wasn't a good family man? Two days before the flight, she sent him a message. That's about a thousand kilometers an hour. This is gonna hurt. Ah. So do you know where it is? Yeah. But my house or not? It's not much further. No, it's not much further. How can you leave our families out there? Find out what went wrong and make sure it doesn't happen again. Well, let's get out and explore it. The untold story of MH370 continues tonight. It's 12.42 in the morning, local time in Kuala Lumpur, when Malaysia Airlines flight MH370 takes off, bound for Beijing. None of the 239 passengers or crew are ever seen or heard from again. And the mystery surrounding the plane's disappearance has only deepened as the years have passed. Part of what forms the whole MH370 mystery are all the wild conspiracy theories about what might have happened to it. All you need to do is look online to see some of the more colourful explanations. That it's in the Cambodian jungle, or was sucked into a black hole. Maybe even the Russians have got it. But experts citing real-life examples have narrowed it down to a handful of likely scenarios. All of them end up in the same place. How it got there is what divides opinion. Captain Zahari Ahmed Shah was a 53-year-old pilot with 18,000 flying hours. MH370 was his final flight. He lived here in this gated community in Kuala Lumpur's upmarket Shah Alam. He was a married father of three adult children and a grandfather, known as Ari to his friends and Uncle Ari to his many nieces and nephews. He's an intriguing figure, and he's got quite a lot of uh, aspects to him. By all accounts, he was a superb pilot, absolutely full of capacity to train others, and he was very senior, he was in his 50s, highly respected, highly liked. He seemed to be a fun guy, by all accounts. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is a YouTube video that I've made um, as a community uh, service. In his downtime, Captain Shah also made videos for his own YouTube channel. In the background here is his home flight simulator. He's a jovial person, a very friendly guy, uh, very easily approachable. Uh, he's also a good family man, a good father to his three, three children. This is young Zahari Shah back in his early flight training days when he was chosen by Malaysia Airlines to join its cadet pilot program. His love of flying is well documented. He even built and flew model aircraft in his spare time. Is it possible that he hijacked the plane and killed those people? I absolutely don't agree with that. Why? I don't see him uh, as a person who could do that. Zahari was politically active and a distant relative of Anwar Ibrahim, the country's opposition leader who was convicted of sodomy a day before the doomed flight. He was said to be quite upset by that verdict. Now, he was active in the party, but again, there's no claim of responsibility in any of this. But that's one lead. Again, 
it, would it be enough for him to take such drastic action without saying he did it? Difficult to say. It's also claimed Zahari had affairs and his marriage was in trouble, all denied by his family and friends. A woman about 20 years his junior, with whom he had clearly a fairly close relationship, she denied that it was of a sexual nature, but she said she broke this relationship off some months before the flight, but two days before the flight sent him a message, a WhatsApp message, that she wouldn't divulge. So there you know, a lot of tantalizing things that go in various directions. But again, I don't think there's any smoking gun in any of this. Do you know no. that to be true? That, uh, that maybe he wasn't a good family man? Well, I will take that with a pinch of salt, really, because I believe that the media uh, has uh, sensationalized uh, and misled uh, the story into believing that he has to paint a picture that he has a troubled family life. I don't believe that. The man had uh, had two houses and three cars and there's no evidence that he had uh, life insurance. He had some political interests uh, in, in Malaysia, but uh, if he was doing it for a cause, then surely that cause would have been made public. So none of the theories are perfect. Uh, none of the, all of the theories about its loss are flawed, but, uh, but the, the end line, the, the end of the line is the aircraft did change dramatically its course and headed out to sea to a place where it would be very, very difficult to find. When um, I, I first heard of this, uh, of this disaster, um, I rang the Malaysian Prime Minister and I offered Australian assistance. That assistance was, uh, was very gratefully accepted. It became apparent after a few days that the plane uh, had followed a very different course and we dramatically scaled up uh, our involvement in that search. MH370 vanished during Tony Abbott's tenure as Prime Minister, a time when he enjoyed what he calls a strong and constructive relationship with his Malaysian counterpart, Najib Razak. Um, he was a good friend to Australia. Since then, embroiled in an unrelated corruption scandal, Razak's career has imploded. I don't comment on uh, the domestic issues which uh, have since brought him low, but uh, uh, he was a good partner and he was a good friend to Australia. While Captain Zahari Shah's family and friends may well be certain of his innocence, Tony Abbott was left in no doubt about who was responsible. Uh, it was pretty obvious that uh, someone had been in charge of that aircraft. The aircraft do not do the kind of thing uh, that that aircraft did uh, unless someone is at the controls. My understanding, my very clear understanding from the very top levels of the Malaysian government is that uh, from very, very early on here, uh, they thought it was uh, murder-suicide by the pilot. They said that to you? I'm not going to say uh, who said what to whom, but let me reiterate, I want to be absolutely crystal clear. Uh, it was understood uh, at the highest levels that this was almost certainly murder-suicide by the pilot, uh, mass murder-suicide by the pilot. How long after the plane disappeared did that information become clear to you? Uh, within a matter of uh, uh, a week or so. What's interesting about this admission is that the Malaysians never named or blamed Captain Zahari at least not publicly. Despite media reports that the plane was hijacked, I wish to be very clear. We are still investigating all possibilities as to what caused MH370 to deviate from its original flight path. Even when Malaysia finished its final report in 2018, it wasn't willing to point the finger. The team is unable to determine 
the real cost for the disappearance of the MH370. Malaysia's official report into MH370 provided nothing substantial. It was vague on detail, but most significantly gave the pilot the all clear. The report said it couldn't have been Zuhari because his mental state was satisfactory and his ability to handle stress at work was good. He had no history of apathy or anxiety, nor were there any behavioural changes that raised any concerns. What was the reasoning that the Malaysians gave you? Well, um, it was crystal clear uh, to me that they had uh, a very clear understanding that this almost certainly was what had happened. Did they point to any evidence at that point? Did they say, we found this or no, we heard from this? No, no. When you're dealing at this level, um, if you are told that something is the clear understanding, uh, you don't need to go into a vast amount of detail. If that's true, then that would have to point to some kind of cover-up. Look, um, that's not my assumption at all. Um, uh, and I've read all these stories that the Malaysians allegedly uh, didn't want uh, the murder-suicide theory pursued because they were embarrassed about uh, one of their pilots uh, doing this. Um, I, I have no reason to accept that. Why didn't you say something about this at the time? Well, at the time, um, and I had a lot to say about this at the time, uh, but at the time, uh, I was focused on finding the plane. Seven days after MH370's disappearance, Malaysian police search Sahari's home and find, on his flight simulator, practice runs to the southern Indian Ocean just one month before the doomed flight. It's a stunning piece of evidence which isn't made public until it's leaked 18 months later. Now, the significance of that is that there's nowhere to land anywhere near where that track took it at the end. There, there are no islands, there's nothing. And so by processing that flight on his flight simulator, he was practicing what could only be a suicide murder flight. You must also remember that uh, there were 2,700 flight simulations in his simulator, and only a few out of these 2,700 end up in South Indian Ocean. But doesn't that strike you as unusual? Nothing unusual, because it's very common for pilots to practice ditching. But why not ditch somewhere closer? Well, there, I, I do not know. I cannot explain why he chose South Indian Ocean, of course. Look, um, that sort of stuff uh, is not something that, as Prime Minister, you would expect to be officially briefed on. It seems a key piece of evidence, though, doesn't it, and backs up that theory that well, it was murder-suicide. Well, well the most obvious explanation is invariably the best explanation. Did they ever mention fire on board? Uh, that's not something that was ever discussed with me. Hijack? Terrorism? Not something that was ever discussed with me. The clear understanding from very early on uh, was that this was mass murder-suicide by the pilot. Grace Nathan has every reason to feel anger towards the pilot. Her mother was on board MH370. But a lawyer by trade, she won't accept Mr Abbott's claim at face value. Well, I find it hard to believe because it's still not supported by any evidence. Even if the Malaysian government were to say that, then what did they base that off of? What information is it that they have that led them to that conclusion that they haven't shared with us now? Do you blame the pilot? Uh, while I, I'm open to the possibility it could have been a pilot, I do not blame the pilot. Grace Nathan is stuck in the past. Memories of love and loss are on a painful, permanent loop. Well, my mum was like the centre of the family, the glue that held everyone together. She was always at home, so home was associated to mum. To mum, wherever mum was, that was home. How often do you think about her? Every day. Grace was sitting her final law exams in England when she received a distressing midnight phone call from her father in Beijing. And he said, 
uh, book a flight and come home. And I to asked him why, what happened? And then he said, something happened to the plane your, your mother was on. And I just remember at that very moment, like I, I dropped the phone, like the phone just fell out of my hand. And our thoughts and prayers are with all affected passengers and crew and their family members. Grace may reserve judgment for the pilot, but she does blame the Malaysian government. I think I was angry from the very beginning because uh, the story kept changing and we found out that there was a lot of uh, mistakes made by like the military, the Malaysian government, and things that they could have done differently that would have... Uh, I mean, even if they couldn't recover the plane, at least we would have known where it was because we know that things are a lot worse than what they could have been because of the incompetencies. Somehow, Grace held herself together. She clung to the hope it was all a misunderstanding and the plane would eventually be found intact. Until the flaperon washed up on Reunion Island. It's clearly from an aircraft and the barnacles indicate it's been in the ocean for some time. For me, that was the straw that broke the camel's back because I think that was the first time I had to acknowledge that yes, maybe the plane did crash. Despite evidence stacked up against the pilot, Grace still doesn't entertain criticism, but rather shares concern for his family, who she believes are also victims. So you're still willing to give the pilot the benefit of the doubt? Yes, definitely. Like, that is really unfair to just pin it on the pilot when you don't know for sure, because that affects a lot of people, especially his family, his children. I'm an adventurer, I'm an explorer, and different people call me the debris searcher or the wreck hunter or the real life Indiana Jones because I'm finding things that other people are unable to find. The beachcomber. The beachcomber, that's fine. Blaine Gibson is an unlikely hero, a lawyer by trade who sold his house in California and spends the money seeing the world. It's been my goal since I was seven years old to go to every country in the world. How many countries are you up to? 185. 185. There are 195 in the world, independent countries. I've been to 185 of them. Gibson became obsessed with the MH370 mystery, so he flew to the countries where oceanographers predicted debris could wash up. In Mozambique, country number 177 on his list, he found the plane's no-step panel after searching with a local fisherman. Suddenly, Suleiman, who's the boat owner, called me over. He said, Blaine, is this the plane? Is this Malaysia 370? And it was a grey triangular object, and I walked over to him, and it said no-step on it. And then I knew that it was aviation. And they analysed it. And they confirmed it, and they used the words almost certainly from Malaysia 370. So no step was a big step in no the search? No step was a big step, yes. That big step gave Gibson momentum. He was hooked. Next stop, Madagascar. On the first day, we found three pieces of debris. Which were? One was the panel that goes right above the flapper on, and it was also from the right side of the plane. And then at the end of the day, it was the piece that holding it in my hands, it, it made me cry, it broke my heart. And, and that was the case around the TV screen on the back of the seat in front of you. This is a piece of a seat <laughs> from the main cabin I'm holding right in my hands. And this is probably the last thing that somebody saw. To date, 32 pieces that are believed to be from MH370 have been found at different locations around the world. So you've got a debris field in six countries. Tanzania, South Africa, Mozambique, La Réunion, Mauritius. Madagascar. Blaine, with the help of locals, has collected over half of them. 17 pieces of debris, either suspected or now confirmed, 
to be from the wreckage of MH370. What I have found makes it very clear to me that the plane crashed in the southern Indian Ocean somewhere north of, say, 36 degrees south latitude. A lot of people were saying, oh, the main cabin is intact underwater somewhere. No, it's not. This plane tragically shattered on impact. This plane is not intact underwater. All of the debris that I have found and held in my hands says to me the word shattered. Pieces of the interior cabin, pieces of the tail, pieces of the wing, the landing gear door. So we know that it was a very high speed impact. It is probably the most difficult search in history. What does it say to you, though, that after all this time, it still hasn't been found? <sighs> Look, uh, it says to me that we should still be looking. Uh, it says to me that uh, uh, if at first you don't succeed, try, try and try again, because this is not something that a decent people, and I'm not just referring to Australia here, I'm referring to uh, all of the countries who had citizens on that plane. This is not something that a decent people can let go. Coming up. That's about a thousand kilometres an hour. This is going to hurt. <laughs> My very clear understanding from the very top levels of the Malaysian government, uh, they thought it was... Uh... Were you told? I don't recall ever being told that explicitly. So someone like Byron Bailey might be right. Yes. As far as I'm concerned, it's game over. We know where it is. We've always known where it is. so long ago that Malaysia Airlines was ranked among the top 10 in the world. It was a great source of national pride. But after 2014, following two fatal crashes, it slipped way down that list. To be fair, one plane was shot down over a war zone while the other was the likely doing of a rogue pilot. So the company can't be completely to blame. But investigations were bungled in a PR nightmare that lurched from one problem to the next. And a once mighty brand is now permanently stained. When Malaysia Airlines Flight 370 disappeared from radar screens in the early hours of the 8th of March 2014, Captain Zahari Shah was the pilot in command. My very clear understanding from the very top levels of the Malaysian government is that uh, from very, very early on here, uh, they thought it was uh, murder-suicide by the pilot. This is what then Prime Minister Tony Abbott was told in private about a week after the plane vanished. It's information that's critical in determining where, in the southern Indian Ocean, MH370 is likely to have ended its flight. Did you share that information with Warren Trust, say, or your government departments to help define the search area? Um, what I believed was happening, uh, and what I certainly expected to happen, was that uh, the search would cover uh, the maximum possible range of that aircraft. I had no reason to think uh, that the search was being restricted uh, on the basis that uh, the pilot had nothing to do with it. In the early stages of the search, the Malaysian government believed it was a suicide mission and that the Australian government was told about that. Were you aware of it? Well, it was always considered that uh, an op uh, one, of the, uh, one of the possibilities and, and probabilities uh, that uh, it was uh, a murder-suicide. 
Warren Truss was Federal Transport Minister and Deputy PM at the time. He was one of the key decision makers in the search. So you were told about that? Uh, I'm sure we're aware of that. But what do you mean? Were you, were you told? I can't recall a particular day when the Malaysians called and, and, and said that, but I think everyone had come to that conclusion. Three weeks into the hunt for the missing aircraft, former Chief of Defence Sir Angus Houston was brought in to coordinate the search. We haven't found anything anywhere that has any connection. In his role, he participated in meetings at the very highest levels. What did the Malaysian PM tell you about what he thought happened? He didn't, he didn't indicate what he thought ha had happened. Um, and neither did uh, Prime Minister uh, Abbott. So the Prime Minister at the time never told you... No. ..what the Malaysian leader told him? No. So murder-suicide never came up? No. No, I don't recall ever being told that explicitly by anyone in authority in Malaysia that that was the case. I was kept in touch with the police, Malaysian police investigation, uh, both directly and through the Australian Federal Police, uh, but no one ever passed on to me that level of certainty from the Malaysians. Martin Dolan's role in the hunt for MH370 was critical. As head of the Australian Transport Safety Bureau at the time, he spent the final two years of his career on the search. I look back on it with, primarily with regret that we weren't able to deliver, particularly for the families, what the answers that they were so desperately looking for. Is that something that still nags at you? Of course. It's not the sort of thing you can easily give away when you devote that much of your time and focus to one thing, not to succeed in the task of finding the missing aircraft. Yes. And you review everything, you think, did we get something wrong, should we have done it differently? All of those things, yes. Both the Minister for Transport and the ATSB based their parameters for the search on what's described as a ghost flight or a death dive, meaning the pilot was also dead when the plane ran out of fuel at 40,000 feet. You once said it was highly, highly likely the plane was on autopilot at the end. Do you still think that? Well, I think that it's uh, likely that um, there was no one alive on the aircraft in the last few hours. Uh, clearly, there was a, a, a somebody uh, directed the or, or directed the, the course that the aircraft took to make the turns to the to the west and then to the south. Uh, that was obviously under some kind of uh, human intervention at that time. But I suspect uh, that it was on autopilot from then on. And whether there was anybody alive is is a matter for conjecture. So you haven't changed your mind when it comes to that. I, I, I'm of the view that, that uh, there was no one alive on the plane for the last few hours. OK, left engine is quitting. If that was true, if no one was in control when MH370 ran out of fuel, it would have spiralled into what's known as a death dive. Left engine shut down. In a 777 simulator, Pilot Byron Bailey shows me what, if that were the case, would have happened. 570 knots, that's about a thousand kilometres an hour. This is going to hurt. The plane's design meant it would corkscrew, increasing speed until it plunged into the ocean. So you can see the sea coming up. The visuals. That's it. <laughs> so that's a big crash. Horrendous. That's a big you crash. would have exploded into millions of bits. The final end of flight scenario is crucial to establishing the possible location of the MH370 wreckage. Byron Bailey has always maintained the search zone was wrong. He says it couldn't have been a death dive. He believes the pilot glided the plane as far as possible and landed it on the water outside the search zone just after sunrise so he could see the swell. 
all the evidence points to the fact it was ditched. And I'm sure the captain, brilliant captain as he was, brilliant pilot, was trying to ditch the aircraft in, in as far south, uh, remote location as possible and leave as little wreckage as possible that would sink. Byron Bailey started out as a young navigator turned fighter pilot with the New Zealand Air Force and went on to fly Boeing 777s for the Emirates airline for 15 years. He's been an outspoken critic of the search and our government's handling of the disaster, saying about 200 million taxpayer dollars was wasted on searches that found nothing. It's time they came clean admitted that the ATSB was a rogue um, outfit that had no oversight, that made a stupid uh, suggestion, initially to avoid embarrassing the Malaysians. And the Malaysians just sat back through this whole thing. They never agreed with the ATSB that it was a catastrophic event that rendered the pilots unconscious or dead or whatever. The Malaysians said right at the start, it's human intervention. And right at the end, they said it's human intervention. They knew. What are they going to tell me when I talk about Byron Bailey? Are they going to say, the old man is bonkers? Oh, sure. I've been flying aeroplanes for over 50 years. Got 1,000 hours command on Boeing triples, 26,000 hours total. No, I actually fall in the category of being an aviation expert. My colleagues like Mike Keane, who was chief pilot of UK's largest airline, he's along with me. He's an expert. My concern in this case, for those who say that the aircraft crashed in a <coughs> so-called ghosted flight, they made up their minds near the start that this occurred. So they're looking for supporting evidence all the way along the line to collaborate that uh, part. Sometimes it's convenient to turn you back on something as far as government's concerned. What are you referring to there? Uh, countries are very protective about uh, their own organisations, airlines, reputations, etc. Like Byron Bailey, Mike Keane began his aviation career as a navigator with the New Zealand Air Force. He too became a fighter pilot and survived a catastrophic crash, ejecting with just seconds to spare. So that was your plane? Yeah. Thousands of pieces? Yeah. The whole aircraft was uh, from the cockpit back, which was just a big ball of fire. You're lucky to be alive, Mike. Yeah, I'm really lucky. He went on to fly commercial airliners around the world. The government says it looked at all possible theories. Well, they haven't. Because they didn't look at yours. Yeah. They didn't look at Byron's. We've worked independently on this. It's not as if we've all got together in a room and said, well, this is it. And in fact, the positions that we were quoting are slightly different. We came from different directions and reached the same conclusions. Despite their parallel careers, Mike Keane and Byron Bailey had never met before the disappearance of MH370 it's their shared interest in how the flight ended that has brought them together. I've got other people behind me that are seriously qualified people, but they won't listen to any of us. Just ignore us. Both Byron and Mike say they know exactly where to search for the wreckage of MH370. They should be searching a little bit further south. What they've done is they've made up <coughs> Uh, a point there of doing a search on the assumption the aircraft's just gone into virtually a vertical dive. Why didn't they take into account and do a search on information which came from people like ourselves on going a little bit further south on the assumption that the aircraft did not go into a vertical dive but uh, did a landing on the, uh, on the water? Where is the wreckage, in your view? I think it's probably the best part of about... 150 k's further south than where they're searching at the moment. We're in cruise at 39,000 feet. Back in the flight simulator, Byron shows me what he thinks happened. Hello, engines running now. Looks like we have flamed out. At 40,000 feet and out of fuel, he glides the plane as far as he can. Uh, he would have ditched into wind to keep the speed down as much as possible to avoid a lot of wreckage. So that's what we'll try and do, all right? When Byron recreated the death dive, the plane crashed within a few minutes of passing the seventh arc. Get one more. Now what that 
this morning is I haven't got the gear down. This time, we fly for almost half an hour. That's 500 feet before we ditch. Reaching at least 130 kilometres in distance and in Byron's view, past the search zone. OK, I'll start to flare now. And then we hit the water. Yeah. We are dead. So do you know where it is? Yeah. Where is it? Latitude 3910 South East 88 18. If Byron's right, this is it. Just outside the search zone. That's very specific. Yep. What if you're wrong? Well, let's just say the ATSB, as part of their searching 40 miles either side of the arc, came within about 30 kilometres of where we reckon the aeroplane ditched. If I'm wrong, then it means the aeroplane's probably been taken by aliens or is sitting in a hangar somewhere in Kazakhstan. That's how sure you are. Absolutely, I'm You're so sure. You're willing to bet anything on it? I'll bet that my house on it. that plane is in that specific spot? Yeah, I'll bet, bet my house on it. As far as I'm concerned, it's game over. We know where it is. We've always known where it is. The ATSB did consider the possibility of a controlled ditching and found, by using a 777 simulator, it was possible. But like Blaine Gibson, the ATSB concluded the small pieces of debris indicated a high-speed impact with water that was not consistent with a controlled ditching. However, over time, Martin Dolan changed his mind. Do you still believe that it was a final out-of-control dive? Uh, I think the evidence is less, uh, less clear now. Given that we have managed to eliminate most of the um, area associated with that scenario... Um, so if you had your time again, where would you search? There's nothing fundamentally different that we would do. We just now have some additional information which has been brought to bear and still leads to the conclusion that the most likely location is in or around the, the area that we have been searching. That means there's an increasing likelihood that there was um, someone at the controls at the end of flight. Does Australia face any blame? Well, uh, we were looking in the wrong place. Uh, we, were, we were obviously guided in the choice of that place by experts around the world. There was a multi-nation agreement uh, that this was the place that we, we should look. So someone like Byron Bailey might be right? Yes. He might be right. I don't disagree with any of the basic assumptions that Byron has. You already searched 120,000 square kilometres of ocean. Why not search another 7,000 more? Well, and then another 10,000 after that. Uh, we had already increased the search area on a number of occasions and it was a multinational agreement that uh, any further search was less likely to find the aircraft. Now, with the benefit of those areas being uh, eliminated, anyone can come up with a third best option. But how far do you go? If uh, it is a fact that the furthest reaches were not explored uh, because of assumptions uh, of a um, pilot who was no longer at the controls, um, I would say, uh, let's ditch that assumption. Uh, let's assume that it was murder-suicide by the pilot and if there is any part of that ocean that could have been reached on that basis that has not yet been explored, let's get out and explore it. Coming up. Spend the money and find that plane. It's incredibly important. Everyone who flies, the minute we get in the air, we're a bit worried. How can you leave our families out there? How do we find it? I have an idea. Oh, I'm a different person. Now I have a, I can see a future. Loves the tonic, huh? Yes, it is. I'm like the, the luckiest and the unluckiest and the luckiest woman again to find love. France is now the only country still conducting an active investigation into the crash. 
Boeing, who built the 777, has handed over streams of data that the French are now working through for their own victims. So far, it's revealed abnormal turns were made at the end of the flight that could only have been done manually, suggesting the pilot was in control at the end. And if that's true, it fits the theory that the aim was to minimize impact. I thought it was the greatest mystery of all time. It just seemed absolutely impossible that an aircraft of that size could just disappear. Record-breaking aviator Dick Smith has been flying since 1973. Like everyone else, he finds the disappearance of MH370 utterly mystifying. What do you think it is specifically that gets people engaged so much with this particular missing plane and this accident? I, I think the reason it's so important and people are so worried about it is it's the, it's the great mystery. Now, when the Airbus aircraft of Air France came down in the Atlantic, a huge amount of money was spent to find the flight data recorder, and then they found out that one of the pilots had held the stick back, and the plane would have come out of stall if they'd just let go. So that would save lots of lives because all training pilots from then on are told, don't hold the stick back, pretty obvious. We can't believe it! We've done it! How hard was it? Bloody hard! His bold adventures are the stuff of legend. I suppose it hasn't been done before. While Dick spent his career both making and taking calculated risks... I'm very excited because I've just pulled out this last map. For him, safety is paramount. He's also the former chairman of the Civil Aviation Authority. It's incredibly important that this aircraft is found because if it was a murder-suicide, we're not going to learn much. But there's a chance that it wasn't just a murder-suicide. There's a chance that something went wrong with the aircraft. And we need to find that aircraft to find that out so people who fly now are safe. It's really important we spend the money. Dick is a firm believer that the hunt for MH370 must continue. That's why we should spend the money and find that plane. It's incredibly important. Everyone who flies, the minute we get in the air, we're a bit worried. Even I'm a pilot and I'm worried, is this flight going to be successful? It's a strange place. You're in this little metal tube that's pressurised on the edge of space. So you want to know every single accident there is, you want people to be able to inspect the hull, find out what went wrong and make sure it doesn't happen again. How do we find it? It's going to be very hard. We have to spend money, and I have an idea. There are four billion passengers that fly every year, and you'd only have to put 10 cents on an air ticket to get $400 million a year to do the search. And that's what we should be doing. If there's ever an example of a government putting profits in front of safety is the way they've stopped searching for that airline. We should keep searching for it. Do you reckon anyone would have a problem with paying 10 cents for a ticket? Who's the self-interest in this? The self-interest in every one of us that flies in the air. And uh, there's four billion of us a year. That's not much on each ticket. 10 cents would give $400 million to actually get the search going again. And I believe with that amount of money, you'd find the aircraft. Excuse me, your quick sit up. Finding MH370 is an outcome <laughs> Danica Weeks and the other families who lost loved ones that day would dearly love to see. OK, well, let's... Um, uh, Tanika, I'll start with you. Just a uh, big smile on your face now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Despite all the heartache that Danika suffered after losing her much-loved husband, Paul, her life has turned a very unexpected corner. I'm a different person, very, very different person. Sometimes I pitch myself and think, gee, who was that girl beforehand? Um, but no, life's good. And I see now I, have a, I can see a future. And that's been something I haven't had for six years. Loves the tonic, huh? Yes, it is, absolutely. And that tonic is John. I say I'm like the, the luckiest and the unluckiest and the luckiest woman again to find love. You know, some people don't find it the first time round, mm. and I've been lucky to find it a second. Were you ready, Danica, to open yourself up again? Yes, for the right person, because as soon as... No, he told me he was going to support me and whatever endeavours I took on and he he appreciated my fight to bring Paulie home and and yep. that was it. John, you're not just with Danica, you're with the ghost of Paul. How do you deal with that? I think that 
from what I know, what Dan's told me of him, that he's similar to my style of man, you know? I'm a, a man's man, I know what's right, I know what's wrong, I know how to raise a kid, I can start a fire, I can, can fish, fish. <laughs> I can supply, I can, I can provide, I can do just about anything that needs to be done as a man. And I think that Paul was very similar to me. So I think that's why I sort of stack up to that type of person. But Danica has not just herself, but her two young sons to consider. Lincoln and Jack are now aged nine and six. Introducing John was a decision that wasn't taken lightly. And I tried to sort of pull out of it and think it's, it's too early. And then I saw John with the boys on the beach and I went, this is right. This is, I need to be you know, vulnerable. I had my, you know, I had my wall up because, you know, I've, I've had to, ch I've changed and I've had to fight a real battle. It is difficult to know that there's always going to be that factor that for the boys, not just Dan, but for the boys as well, that their father's always been, they've never known him as much as they needed to. And that's going to be my job to take the baton and bring these boys up in a very difficult world with 100% support. And they just need everything that they're going to get from me to walk out into that big world and go, all right, I'm going to be a man. And that's my job. It's a job that John's embracing wholeheartedly. That was a deliberate plan to not go so fast. I had to be right with it. And, uh... I think we both did. Yeah, yeah, true. Mm. And it was the right time. Yeah, I think it was definitely being able to find each other's parameters and let the boys get to know me, let Dan get... Well, all of us get to know each other. I think that's the most important part before we just barrel out and get married. Yeah. <laughs> and that's just what they've done this year. And what do the kids think? Oh, they're ecstatic. They're, they are. They're really happy. And I think you asked me once whether Paul would, you know, would agree with his parenting style. And I said, actually, yes. You know, they're very similar. You know, Paul's from the army. He has this, you know, obviously strong personality. And John has that strong personality. I have no qualms in that John will raise our boys exactly the way that Paul would have wanted. Mm. I think Paul would be, wherever he, wherever he is, would be looking down and going, yes, Dan, yeah, you got it right. And for the families of the 239 people who perished on board, all they have left is hope. I just wish we got a lucky break along the way so that we could have uh, found, found it because the families continue to suffer. It's about those poor souls who were lost and the grieving relatives who've been left behind. And that's always what this has got to be about. Uh, those who were lost, those who were left behind, and for their sakes, continuing the search. The search for any answers at all. But for now, the official government position is that another search won't be launched until new, credible information is uncovered. If you had someone at the controls deliberately trying to take the aircraft as far away as possible and to leave its final location uncertain, the area to cover that possibility is just so enormous that the search would be, it's theoretically possible, but the price of it would be beyond anything that I think anyone would be willing to pay. I think that someday it will be found, the underwater wreckage, and someday we will know the truth, and I hope it's in my lifetime. I talk to Kath and Bob pretty well every day, and it's still like they're, they're with me here, no matter what, but I, I can't say goodbye. I know, it sounds odd, I know, because they're not coming home, I know that, but I can't say goodbye. Yeah. To give up a search, how can you leave our families out there? I need him home and I won't, I won't leave him out there. He wasn't just my husband, he was my best friend. No, he's, he's my family. No one takes from my family. 
with no answers. That's it, end of. And I'll keep fighting until I know. 370, Malaysian 370. 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 Mal